Good morning, everyone. We are finally there. We are finally at the Colosseum, the very icon of Rome. And because I think of the Colosseum as the very icon of Rome, I've called today's lecture The Creation of an Icon, the Colosseum and Contemporary Architecture in Rome. But before we discuss the Colosseum, I want to say a few words, a, a few more words about Nero, the last of the Julio-Claudian emperors. And I show you a portrait of Nero here, ensconced uh, in his Domus Aurea with the uh, fourth style wall of Fabulous behind him. And I wanted to just say and, and, and bring your attention to the fact that it really is quite amazing that we have the names of so many of Nero's artists and architects. And that can only attest to the fact that he must have gathered around him truly the greatest artists of the day. Artists whose accomplishments were so superb uh, that their names have been recorded for posterity at a time when very few artists and architects' <coughs> names are recorded. And I just want to remind you of that group. Uh, think, of course, of the painter of Nero, the man who was responsible for painting the third style walls of Nero's Domus Aurea, fabulous himself, uh, and who also appears to have been the innovator of the fourth style of Roman wall painting. There was also Zenodorus, who was the most famous bronze caster of his day, a Greek artist of great renown, whom Nero hired to make his colossal statue, the colossal statue, 125 feet tall, out of bronze, that depicted Nero in the guise of the sun god, Saul, and a statue that was referred to as the Colossus. And lastly, but not least by any stretch of the imagination, were the two architects of Nero, Severus and Keller, Roman architects, we believe, Severus and Keller, who were responsible for the Domus Aurea itself, for all the architectural innovations and experimentations at the Domus Aurea. Uh, and it was they who, we believe, were the creators of the remarkable octagonal room, as I mentioned last time, probably the most extraordinary room we've seen thus far this semester and one that's going to have lasting impact on later Roman buildings and complexes. <coughs> so the, the octagonal room and also I mentioned to you other things in the villa including a banqueting hall with a revolving ceiling. So these men also great architectural innovators. So when Nero is forced to commit suicide in 68, we have to ask ourselves, what happened <coughs> to those artists? What happened to those innovations after, the after <coughs> Nero was discredited? And I mentioned also last time that when Nero uh, was, 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 uh, committed suicide, when he was discredited, he received an official Domnatio Memoriae from the Senate, a damnation of his memory, which meant that his portraits uh, could, not could be and were encouraged to be destroyed, and the same with his buildings. So what is going to happen to the evolution of Roman architecture when one of its greatest patrons, someone who encouraged the greatest architects and artists of the day, uh, when he and his memory are annihilated and his buildings are destroyed? What is going to happen to architectural innovation? That's the main question we need to ask ourselves today as we look at the buildings that were commissioned by his successors, by members of the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian, Titus, and ultimately Domitian. We'll talk about Vespasian today, a bit on Titus, and then more on <coughs> Titus and Domitian on Tuesday, what happens to these innovations uh, when they begin to take over and when they begin <coughs> to commission buildings. And we're going to see it's mixed. We're going to see a certain move back toward a conservative uh, vision, uh, but we're also going to see that Nero's innovations live on, and that's the most exciting uh, piece of, of this particular Flavian uh, puzzle, as we shall see. So we see again Nero here, uh, and when Nero, when Nero died in 68 AD, uh, what happened was not only that he received a Domnatio Memoriae, but there were no other Julio-Claudians to succeed him, and Rome and the empire were plunged once again into a very serious civil war, a civil war that was as uh, as profound, uh, profoundly, uh, profoundly troubling as the civil war that had followed Caesar's death. 
uh, and uh, Caesar's, death, Caesar's death, as you know, in 44 BC. And what emerged after this civil war, or during this civil war, was uh, one of the most complicated uh, and difficult years in Rome's history, the year 68 to 69, during which Rome had four emperors, not co-emperors, as Rome was to have much later in its history, but competing emperors in very quick succession, some of them holding on to power for only a few months. These men were uh, Galba, G-A-L-B-A, whose portrait you see on a coin in the upper left, uh, Galba, who becomes emperor right after Nero's death, and you can see him in a no-nonsense uh, uh, realistic portrait on that coin in the upper left. He is succeeded very soon after by a man by the name of Otho, O-T-H-O. Uh, you see him on the gold coin on the right, Otho, who saw Nero as a soulmate and had himself rendered very much with a Neronian hairstyle, as you can see. And then third, uh, a man by the name of uh, Vitellius, V-I-T-E-L-L-I-U-S, Vitellius, who seems to have had more chins uh, than any other <coughs> emperor in the history of Rome, as you can see in this wonderful portrait now in Copenhagen. And then ultimately Vespasian, B-E-S-P-A-S-I-A-N, Vespasian, uh, who was the only one of these four who was able to hold on to power long enough to create a new dynasty a new dynasty that he called after his family name, Flavius was his family name, the so-called Flavian dynasty. And fortune uh, was on his side because he had two sons to succeed him, Titus and Domitian, uh, and because he had two sons to succeed him, he was able to uh, create a, a quite successful dynasty, as we shall see, that had uh, l lasting power. So this is our second main imperial dynasty, the Flavian dynasty, as opposed to the Augustan and Julio-Claudian dynasty. Now Vespasian came to power in a civil war. <laughs> And like Augustus before him, he recognized that although coming to power in the Civil War could give you the authority that you needed to govern, it didn't give you the legitimacy. It was very important in the eyes of the Romans to have had an important foreign victory to give your dynasty legitimacy. Augustus came to power after his Civil War with Mark Antony. Uh, but he looked to his victory over the Parthians in the eastern part of the empire to give his reign legitimacy. Vespasian does the same thing. He comes to power in a civil war. He beats back other Romans. So he has to look elsewhere for legitimacy. And he also looks east. Uh, he looks specifically to Judea. Uh, and he sends his son in, his son Titus in, uh, to do war against uh, Jerusalem. And uh, Titus was victorious in the early 70s AD in this very important Jewish war uh, that I'll have more to say about later today and also uh, especially on Tuesday. So Vespasian also uh, a con a con is, a, is a, a, with his son Titus, is a victor in a foreign war, and that becomes uh, the basis of their right to rule, and we'll see references to those Jewish wars in their art, uh, even in our conversation today. I also want to say, with regard to Vespasian, not only was he a, uh, a, a great military strategist, uh, but he also seems to have been an extremely shrewd politician, someone who recognized that you could use architecture in the service of ideology. And that's, in fact, what we're going to see him doing today. And he starts this from the very beginning of his reign. I go back here, too, and we'll look at it a number of times today. It really is going to loom large in, our, in, in today's discussion, the site plan of Nero's Domus Aurea that we looked at last time. And you'll remember the location of the uh, Golden House of Nero up uh, on the Esquiline Hill, uh, the only part of it that still survives, the so-called Esquiline Wing, which you can see there. Uh, and here, the great artificial lake, uh, the Colossus by Zenodorus, located over there. Uh, and, uh, and you can see the way those are deployed uh, in that 300 to 350 uh, area, area that acres of area that, uh, that uh, Nero had his architects build up. Claudius, uh, excuse me, uh, Vespasian, uh, as he thinks about how to move forward uh, with architecture and to begin to commission buildings, 
The first thing that strikes him very wisely is he does not want to associate himself with Nero. In fact, he wants to disassociate himself with Nero, who has now been damned. But he looks back at the Julio-Claudians, and he recognizes that there is some merit in linking himself with them, uh, and quite specifically with Claudius, who was the, it was the best, uh, after, uh, in addition to Augustus, was the best of the more recent lot, uh, and Claudius was made into a god at his death. So he looks to Claudius, and he notices the fact that there is a, a temple of Claudius that was begun uh, on this very property by Claudius's wife, uh, his last wife, Agrippina the Younger, the woman with the poisoned mushrooms, Agrippina the Younger, who also, you'll recall, was the mother of Nero. Uh, and Agrippina the Younger had begun, after Claudius's death and divinization, a temple in honor of Claudius. Nero, who had no, uh, no particular affection for his mother, and as you'll remember, had her murdered, uh, decided that he didn't want any part of her building project either, and, and put a stop to it, especially when he decided that he had other uh, plans uh, for this particular area of Rome, uh, namely to build his pleasure palace. So Nero stops construction. He doesn't destroy the building, but he stops construction on it and just leaves it as it is. The light bulb goes on for Vespasian, and Vespasian says to himself, the best way that I can use architecture to make a connection, to make a link between myself and uh, the Julio-Claudians, especially Claudius, is to finish uh, the temple of Claudius that Agrippina began. And that's exactly what he sets out to do. And he does this at the very beginning of his reign. We give a date of A.D. Uh, 70 to the so-called Temple of Divine Claudius, or as, as it is often referred to, the Claudianum uh, in Rome. And you see again the location of that Claudianum right here. Now all that survives of this building today is its platform, and I'm going to show you some details of that platform in a moment. A, a tall, great platform like the platforms of the sanctuaries that we looked at earlier this semester, upon which the temple rested. All that survives is, is, that, is part of that platform. And what I show you first here is a restored view uh, that comes from the Ward Perkins textbook uh, where you can get a very good sense of what this platform looked like. It was a two-storied platform, as I think you can see very well. It had barrel vaulted chambers. It was made out of concrete, barrel vaulted chambers made out of concrete. Uh, and then on the front there were doorways at the bottom and windows on the second tier. And the facing, the concrete, the facing for the concrete was travertine, cut stone travertine, which should immediately ring a bell because you'll remember that it was cut stone travertine that was also used for <coughs> Claudius's harbor at Portus uh, and also for um, the Porta Maggiore in Rome. Uh, and you'll remember also the intriguing combination of of rusticated masonry and smoothed masonry for those two Claudian buildings. The same is true here. So when Agrippina made a decision to put up a building honoring her husband after his death, a temple that would be to him as a divas, she turns back to the style that he himself seems to have favored, this combination of rusticated and finished masonry to use for that building. And I think this underscores the point that I made last time. This choice of style, uh, of this rusticated masonry style, uh, is not something that happened by happenstance. It is likely because of Claudius' <coughs> own predilection as a patron, so that when Agrippina decided how, would be, how it would be best to honor him architecturally, she wanted to honor him in the style that he himself liked. Uh, so she uses, again, this, this combination of rusticated and finished masonry. I can show you again uh, some preserved sections of the uh, of the podium of the Temple of Divine Claudius that will make this even clearer. Uh, before I do, and you see it on the right-hand side of the screen, just to remind you at the left of some of the great podia that we looked at uh, earlier this semester. And since the exam is coming up, there's no time like the present to see if you know your stuff. Does any, can anyone identify this podium here on the left-hand side of the screen? Wendy? 
excellent. The Sanctuary of Jupiter Anxer at Terracina, that's the podium. And you'll remember what was characteristic of it is that it was made out of concrete. It was faced with opus incertum. It had travertine at the corners and over the arches, and it had la lateral arches as well as others to allow the free uh, flow of space. So this idea of these great concrete podiums that served as the base for uh, sanctuaries, it's the same idea here. We see, again, a, 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 a um, podium that also has arches, as you can see, and then on the front of those arches, in this case, uh, great pilasters. Uh, and, and if you look at those pilasters very carefully, and again, it's done out of travertine in this case, when you look at those, those very carefully, you see uh, something very interesting here that makes these slightly different from the other two that we saw. Uh, because you see, uh, you can see that the capital is finished. You can see the upper part of the pilaster. And then if you look very, and then below that, of course, you see these rusticated blocks. But if you look at the, uh, the, at the, in between each of those rusticated blocks very carefully, and I'll show you a better image in a moment where you can see this even more clearly, you will see that part of the pilaster emerges in between each of those rusticated blocks, giving us even more the sense that that finished pilaster is somehow inside uh, the, uh, is inside the rusticated blocks waiting uh, to emerge uh, in a very interesting way. And we could, we could psychoanalyze uh, Claudius. We talked about his past and how he was not, you know, he was ignored as a child and he was shunted aside and because he stammered and so on. You know, one, one could go very far and say that's Claudius, you know, waiting inside to, 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 be, to emerge uh, sometime, there's like, there's like, like a cocoon that, that allows the butterfly uh, to emerge at some point later in life. Uh, we, could, we could try that. I don't know whether you would buy that. But I mean, it's one way in which one can think about this sort of thing. But clearly, whatever it meant, uh, if it was just to point to his antiquarian interest, his interest in a more old-fashioned stone construction at this particular point, uh, it does seem to have something to do with the particular personality uh, of this particular patron. Uh, here's another, here, here's just comparing uh, the, uh, the, ba the podium of the Claudianum to the Porta Majoria in Rome, just to remind you of the rusticated columns there, the rusticated drums of these engaged columns, and then at the uppermost part, uh, the way in which the upper part of the column and the capital uh, are, are dressed smooth uh, and uh, seem to emerge. And that's when I first made that point about the likelihood that the column that we're supposed to read this is the column completed inside, uh, just waiting uh, to, uh, to break free. Uh, and we see the same thing, but a further elaboration of that here. And I think you can see that much better in this particular detail, uh, where you can again see the entire pilaster uh, behind the rusticated masonry. Uh, you see the, the, uh, the finished capital, the finished entablature up above, and then you can make out the entire, uh, the entire pier, all the way, the entire pilaster, all the way down to the base, and then superimposed, or so it seems, it's not really superimposed, <coughs> it's just carved uh, in this way, but in between those, these rusticated blocks. Again, giving me at least the sense uh, that the pilaster is done inside, it's just waiting uh, somehow for its debut out of this travertine block. Now what about the rest of the complex? Uh, we don't know exactly, but we have some general sense that it is quite likely that it was similar to the, um, the sanctuaries that we looked at earlier, the sanctuary of Jupiter Anxer at Terracina and Hercules at Tivoli. And in fact, we do have some fragments of this on what is called the marble plan of Rome. I've referred to that before, the so-called forma orbis. Forma orbis, F-O-R-M-A, a new word, U-R-B-I-S. The forma orbis, which was a marble plan of Rome that was made in the early third century A.D., uh, which was housed in a building that I'm going to show you later today. Uh, and there are fragments of this structure there that give us a sense of what it looked like in, an in antiquity. So we would have had the podium. It's misrestored here. You have to imagine the two tiers that we just looked at before, not this sort of thing. Uh, but those beneath uh, serving as the podium or the decoration of the podium, and then above a large rectangular space with a temple pushed not quite to the edge of the back wall, but one of, toward 
one of the walls, dominating the space <coughs> in front of it. As you can see, we don't know exactly what that temple looked like, but it was probably a fairly conventional temple on the order of so many that we've looked at this semester. What's interesting about this that's different from the other sanctuaries that we saw is that in the rectangular space above, they seem to have planted uh, a lot of bushes, uh, as you can see here. And that becomes very, a very popular way of decorating uh, these kinds of complexes in the Flavian period. We'll see another example later today. The greatest, uh, the most famous uh, building that was put up by Vespasian in the Flavian period was the so-called Colosseum, uh, which he began in the year 70 A.D., so uh, contemporaneous to the, uh, to the construction of the Claudianum. Uh, but it wasn't finished until after his death. He died in 79. He was emperor for nine years, died of natural causes. It wasn't completed until his son Titus became emperor, and Titus completed it and dedicated it in the year 80. We see uh, a view of the Colosseum from above, a Google Earth image of the Colosseum <coughs> from above. It was a very large amphitheater that could hold uh, 50,000 people. It was made of concrete, as we shall see. And this aerial view is very helpful because it shows its, relation, it shows its scale, its size. Uh, it shows that in Rome today, it serves as a kind of giant traffic circle, as you can see here. The Romans love the Colosseum because it is an icon of their civilization, but at the same time, they hate it. Uh, and they're always saying, would, would that it, we could just get rid of it so that traffic would be smoother uh, in this part of Rome. And in fact, there was a scheme uh, a number of years ago now, probably several decades ago by now, uh, there was um, a Texan. Uh, who, who was actually interested in buying the Colosseum and bringing it to Texas uh, to <laughs> display on his ranch. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I mean, th th Italy gave us some thought to that, uh, but they decided, obviously, that they were not going to part uh, with the Colosseum. And fortunately, it has <laughs> stayed intact. Uh, and I don't think the Romans would have been too happy about that at the end of the day, despite the fact that they curse it out on a fairly regular basis. But we see it here, and it's a useful view because it shows it in conjunction to so many of the other uh, buildings and complexes we've been talking about thus far this semester. We're looking back from it toward the later Arch of Constantine that we'll look at at the very end of the course, the Palatine Hill in the upper left, uh, the uh, fo Roman Forum beginning over here with the Temple of Venus and Roma that was done in the second century. We'll talk about that also later. Here, the great Via Vo De Fori Imperiali uh, designed at the behest of Mussolini. And on the right side, of course, the Imperial Fora with the Forum of Julius Caesar and the Forum of Augustus uh, that we have also looked at this semester. <coughs> uh, so here, here you see it here. And then I'm going to sh show you uh, once again, the site plan of Nero, uh, because it's important to know, one of the most important things uh, to know about this monument is where it was sited. And where it was sited shows us again how incredibly shrewd Vespasian was when it came to establishing a political agenda and when it came to trying to court the favor of the public. Uh, he decided to raise, we've, I mentioned this before, he raised to the ground Nero's Domus Aurea destroyed it, destroyed it, despite the fact that it had been done by these great architects, despite the fact that it had res revolving ceilings. Would have been a really cool place for him to live himself. Think about it, uh, he and his dynasty. Uh, but he decided to raise it to the ground for political reasons, to discredit Nero, and, and he hoped to gain favor with the populace. And what he did smartly was to say, what am I going to do with this property? I'm going to return this property to the Roman people. I'm going to build on it something that they would really like to have. So what he does is he fills in the artificial lake, and he uses the area on which the artificial lake was originally uh, located to build the Colosseum. He puts the Colosseum right on the location of the artificial lake. And the message is clear. What did the Roman people want more than anything else? They wanted another, they wanted an amphitheater where they could go, a large amphitheater where 50,000 of them could pack in uh, and watch animal and gladiatorial combats. There is no better way to gain favor with the Roman populace than to build a building like this and to build it on top of Nero's pleasurable artificial lake, pleasurable only for himself, was a huge coup. 
on the part of Vespasian. And we see that happening here and right in proximity to the temple of divine Claudius. Notice the fact also that the, the location of the Colosseum, very close to the Colossus. The name of the Colosseum was really the Flavian Amphitheater, uh, after the family name Flavius, the Flavian Amphitheater. That's how it was known in antiquity. But it, is, it, it came quickly to be known as the Colosseum, not because of its colossal scale, which is what most people think, but because of the Colossus, because of the statue uh, of, uh, of Xenodorus that stood nearby. And by the way, the other thing that Vespasian did was to have the features of Nero erased uh, on that portrait and uh, to make them into the more generic features of the sun god Saul himself. So the statue continued to stand, but it was fixed up. Uh, it was redone, remade, uh, so that it would look like Saul and not like Nero. Uh, but again, the Colosseum takes its name from that. So if you are in any, we used to have a Colosseum here <laughs> in uh, New Haven. Uh, but if, 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 if you are in the future in any arenas that are called Colosseums, uh, you'll know that that name goes back uh, to the Colossus of Nero, the Colossus of Saul, uh, not to the Colosseum itself ultimately. Although I think those who named those arenas were obviously thinking about the Colosseum in Rome. So the location of, this, of the Colosseum, extremely important. And a, and a political statement uh, on Vespasian's part. And we see the, the, this man, this emperor of Rome, Vespasian, very uh, cleverly using architecture to, uh, to, uh, to uh, further his own personal and political agenda. Uh, this view also, this plan, cross-section, and uh, axonometric view that all come from Ward Perkins are also very helpful in us getting a sense of this building. And I think you can see very quickly uh, that, like all other amphitheaters, it had an oval or an elliptical plan. Uh, it was built up with concrete, a series of barrel and annular vaults. Uh, and those, uh, that elliptical plan included essentially radiating uh, barrel vaults, uh, that uh, barrel vaulted ramps and passageways, and a series of annular vaulted corridors that provide lateral circulation and that are buttressed by the thrust of the seating. So it's a scheme that we know already from the amphitheater uh, at Pompeii. We know it also particularly well from the Theater of Marcellus in Rome. And the Theater of Marcellus in Rome was just down the street practically. I'll show you an aerial view later to show you its proximity to the Colosseum. It's not right next to it, but it's within striking distance. And uh, it clearly, the experiments, the architectural experiments in the Augustan period at the Theater of Marcellus were very important uh, in terms of this particular design. It basically follows the same general scheme. The major difference, of course, is that since the Theater of Marcellus was a theater, it was semicircular in plan, <coughs> whereas amphitheater architecture is always elliptical in plan. And that is the case also for the Colosseum. If we look at the, I mentioned that there are annular vaulted corridors. We're looking at the corridor on the first floor of the Colosseum. And you can see very quickly that it is, of course, made of concrete. How else would you get these annular vaults that you see here? They're very well preserved. They're easy to study. Uh, and you can see that those, a those uh, annular vaults rest on great stone piers, uh, these stone piers made out of travertine. Again, you can see that. Uh, extremely well in this particular view. On the set, that's the first floor. On the second floor, however, we see something uh, entirely innovative, and that is the introduction of a new <coughs> form of vault that we haven't seen before. Uh, this is the so-called groin or ribbed vault, uh, spelled exactly as you think it would be, G-R-O-I-N, the groin vault or the rib vault. And you get when you when you take two barrel vaults and make them intersect. The angles that you get create uh, this kind of groin vault. And I show you a, uh, a diagram here, which makes that clear, I think, to you. And then a view of the second story corridors to show you these uh, actual groin vaults, these rib vaults that you see here, which are very interesting and, and add, add something, I think, uh, to these structures. And they become very, very popular. After they begin to be used in the Flavian period, they become very popular. And we'll see uh, the proliferation of groin vaults from this time on. So we talk, I talked at the beginning about what, you know, what, what is concern, what, what, what is 
are the innovations of Nero's uh, Domus Aurea continued under the Flavians? Well, we know that they, the uh, architects of Nero did not use groin vaults, uh, but they were very interested in the free flow of space. Uh, and that interest in the free flow of space continues here. Uh, as does experimentation with concrete, and we see it in the use of these groin vaults on the second story of the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, when you visit the Colosseum in Rome today, you'll note that it does seem quite stripped bare, unfortunately. Uh, but it's important for you to be aware of the fact that it, too, was highly decorated as so many other Roman buildings. And we do have engravings that were made, engravings and paintings that were made uh, when the Colosseum was in better condition uh, and when some of that stucco and painted decoration still existed. And I show you two uh, drawings here that give you some sense of that. And you can see that all the surface was covered with stucco uh, and then with figural decoration, all of which was painted, both the, uh, the, the, the vaults themselves, as you can see above, and uh, the corridors, all of that are very elaborately decorated in ancient Roman times. This is obviously an exterior view of the Colosseum in Rome. The exterior of the building is actually quite well preserved. And I think as you gaze at it, you certainly are struck by the similarity of the scheme to the scheme of the theater of Marcellus in Rome. Uh, in this case, the theater of Marcellus appears to have had three stories, only two of which are currently preserved. Uh, this had four stories, four tiers, as you can see here. Uh, again, the structure itself is concrete. The facing is travertine. We see these great uh, arches, these great arcades, just as we saw them in the theater of Marcellus. And then also, just like the scheme of the theater of Marcellus, columns that are placed in between those arches on the first three stories. Uh, the columns in between those arches on the first three stories, just as the theater in, of Marcellus, have no structural purpose whatsoever. They do not hold the building up as they would have in a Greek or Etruscan context. They are, the building is held up by the barrel and the annular, the barrel and annular vaults that are made out of concrete. Uh, so these, these uh, columns have no structural purpose whatsoever, and they are here essentially as the icing on the cake, as ornamentation or decoration, but ornamentation or decoration that has certain meaning to it, a meaning that certainly uh, conjures up ancient Greece, because you can see here that they have used all the Greek orders, the Doric order, the Ionic order in the second story, the Corinthian order, all of these are engaged columns, the Corinthian order in the third story, and then in the fourth story we see they use pilasters. These are Corinthian pilasters once again. So Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Corinthian again at the uppermost part, columns that have no structure that are used here as pure decoration, but decoration that again has uh, an ideological connection. At the very top, you can see the detail of the pilasters. Between them, you see some uh, travertine <coughs> excuse me, blocks uh, that are uh, brackets that stick out. Uh, those were to support the wooden poles that you'll remember from our conversation about the amphitheater at Pompeii, uh, supported the awning uh, that was used uh, when uh, there was rain. Two more views of the exterior of the Colosseum, a little bit closer up where you can see very well here the Doric order in the first story, the travertine facing, the Ionic order in the second story, and then the Corinthian engaged columns here and the Corinthian pilasters, uh, and then also the brackets uh, extremely well preserved on the, Pantheon, on the uh, Colosseum in Rome. The interior is a different story entirely. It is not as well preserved as the exterior. It is fascinating, however, to see, and I think you can tell uh, from this particular view of the interior where we have so, for, so as always, we have so many tourists uh, inside the Colosseum. Uh, I think you, they, they are very useful because they give you a very good sense of scale of how truly enormous uh, this building is. Uh, they also show you that much of what was once there is no longer there uh, in the interior of the structure. As we look down on it, we can see the elliptical shape of the arena. We can see the substructures here all made of concrete. The ones that are below uh, the arena itself were used for the storage of props, uh, but also for the housing of the animals that were brought up for animal 
combat. There were small, ca there were small and larger uh, cages down here, and I'm going to show you what those looked like in a moment. Uh, so that's the location of those, but again, not in very good condition today. Uh, even more striking is the fact that although you can see again the, uh, the <coughs> concrete substructures for the, s the seats on which the cavea rested, if you look very carefully, you will see there's only a single cuneus uh, that is still preserved with a small number of marble, uh, uh, marble seats. Uh, the whole thing was sheathed in marble in antiquity. All of the seats would have been marble. Uh, only that small section is preserved, and I can show you another view where we see the same. Here we're looking at that one uh, cuneus over here with that one set of marble seats, the only marble seats that are still preserved in the Colosseum today. Why is that, you ask yourselves, and you might ask me. Uh, the reason for that is that the Colosseum was used as a marble quarry uh, for, 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 for practically from the time, uh, you know, I mean, not, not too long after it was built, but certainly in the post-antique period it was used very significantly as a marble quarry. By whom? Uh, by the great princes and even by the popes. The popes did not hesitate uh, to plunge the Colosseum for the marble that they needed uh, <coughs> for the buildings that they were putting up around Rome. Uh, the, the Colosseum ended up in some extraordinary buildings, so it was not for naught, uh, but at the same time, obviously, it, it changed the face of the interior of the, co of the Colosseum forever, as we can see so well here. Two models uh, of uh, what the substructures would have looked like uh, in the area of the Colosseum where the animals were kept. Uh, and they had a system of ramps uh, and pulleys. And they, they took the animals up either up the ramps or by pulley uh, from these cages. You can see they had metal grills in front of them, animals, diverse animals kept uh, down here below and then brought up uh, when needed through openings in the, uh, in the floor, the pavement of the arena. The arena would have been paved with concrete. We have other examples of that elsewhere. I'm going to show you one today. Uh, and there would have been holes uh, in that uh, by which you could bring the animals up uh, to the arena. This is a restored view of what the Colosseum uh, would have, the interior of the Colosseum would have looked like in antiquity uh, when a performance was, uh, when, a, when a gladiatorial performance was taking place. Uh, we see that what they did was they covered over the arena with some kind of ancient version of astroturf. Uh, they planted, they put trees that they probably, I don't know, real or fake trees, not sure which, uh, props that, uh, were th that took the shape of, of mountains, as you can see here, and then the gladiatorial combat, the animal combat would take place against that backdrop. Uh, you can also see the street, the seats, the, the cavea, the wedge-shaped sections of those seats, the cunei. Uh, the 50,000 people packed in uh, for this special event. And then uh, at the uppermost part, you see the awning, or this particular artist's rendition of the awning. I think it's very amusing uh, that the artist has rendered it like an oculus, which is pretty unlikely that it looked uh, quite like that. But I guess that's a very Roman thing to do, so he did that. Uh, but it, looks, it looked probably in antiquity a, quite a bit more like the awning that we saw in the painting in Pompeii uh, that represented a characteristic awning for a Roman amphitheater. The Colosseum, extremely famous in its own day, continued to be famous in antiquity. Uh, I show you here a coin, the reverse of a coin of a boy emperor by the name of Gordian III. You see Gordian up there. Uh, the reverse of his coin in the, third, in the early 3rd century AD, showing the Colosseum. So we certainly know from that that it was still in good condition and being used in the 3rd century. We see the outside with its tiers of columns. We see something, uh, an event going on inside. We see people in the seats, and we see those poles that supported the awning here. And most interestingly, we see the Colossus, which was clearly still standing also in the 3rd century AD, the Colossus uh, in which the uh, features had been changed from those of Nero to those of Saul uh, with the rayed crown. Uh, it was very easy to do that because, as I had mentioned, Nero had been shown originally himself as Saul with the rayed crown. So all they had to do was change the features of the face. They could leave the crown, and that crown clearly still uh, is still there uh, in the 3rd century AD. But just again as a reminder that the Colosseum gets its name from that colossal statue that stood next door. And this one last view of the Colosseum 
Uh, this is a model, which you have on your monument list, a model that probably gives you as good a, an idea as any of what the exterior of the building looked like in antiquity. And I use it here to show you two things. One, that we do believe on the second and third stories uh, there were statues, statues placed in the niches beneath the arches. Uh, and this also shows you very well the way in which the wooden poles rested on the brackets, those wooden poles to serve to support uh, the awning of the structure. Anything and everything goes on at the Colosseum. When I started going to the Colosseum more years ago than I want to say, uh, the um, Colosseum was very easy to get into. It popped over there, you could walk in it was in a flash, never a problem. It's become one of the greatest tourist sites in Rome. Uh, and uh, in fact, a warning if you're going to be making your way, I, I, I think at least one of you mentioned to me spring break trip, uh, but if you're going to be making your way to the Colosseum anytime soon or in the future, it's actually not a bad idea to go online. You can now go online and you can get tickets uh, online for places like the Colosseum. You don't need it for most places, but for the Vatican, the Colosseum, the most popular, it's not a bad idea to get tickets in advance because then you can go on the short line instead of the line that you're going to have to wait for hours uh, to get in. But while you're outside, there's always something going on. This also never used to happen, but recently uh, the, uh, the Romans have gotten smart about, um, <laughs> about realizing that, that, that everyone wants a photo op, and so they supply a host of gladiators outside uh, the entranceway, and especially since everyone is online for so many hours, uh, you might as well have something to do. So they, they stock, uh, stock the place with, with modern gladiators who are more than willing for a certain number of euros uh, to pose in your pictures, and you see a young woman here taking her boyfriend or husband, what, whomever, a picture of him uh, playing the gladiatorial role uh, with this sword, as you can see. And there are lots of fun. It's fun just to, to stand there and watch everybody posing uh, for these extraordinary pictures. We saw that in the Colosseum, the um, substructures were very poorly preserved. And so I wanted to show you another amphitheater where they are well preserved, so you can get a better sense of what those substructures would have looked like in antiquity. And so I take us back to, back south, we go down south to Campania once again, to a place called Pozzuoli. And Pozzuoli is very near to Baia, uh, and near to Naples, and near to Pompeii and Herculaneum and so on. Uh, a town that has one of the best preserved Roman amphitheaters in the, from the ancient Roman world. It dates to the late first century AD. Uh, and I show you a view here of the substructures of the amphitheater, the Roman amphitheater at Pozzuoli. And you can see what I mean. Uh, the annular vaulted corridors down below, well preserved, uh, as are the, uh, the, uh, ca the um, cages in which the animals were kept. In antiquity, the the gates, the grates are gone, but uh, the uh, the cages are still there. Uh, as is much of the ceiling, and it's actually a fun place to wander through because the light effects are incredible. The light effects through the the openings in that ceiling that were the openings through which the animals were uh, were transported by ramp or by pulley up to the arena. Here's another view uh, where you can also get a great sense of these substructures, of the places where the animals were kept, uh, and also of those openings in the ceiling that allowed them uh, to be brought up above. And you can also notice very well here the fact that the construction in this case, late first century AD, is concrete faced with brick, faced with brick. And we talked about another important part of Nero's architectural revolution uh, was the fact that they began to build buildings that were uh, brick-faced concrete buildings. We talked about the fact that that had to do with the fire and the decision taken that brick was more fireproof than stone, uh, and they began to use it, and we see it being used here. So another important architectural revolu uh, re another important <laughs> facet of Nero's architectural revolution that was not lost uh, with the emperor's death. And here you can see the very well preserved uh, pavement of the arena done in concrete with these openings in it, the same openings that you saw just before from down below through which the light came. These are the openings uh, through which props, animals, 
Uh, some of them are very small, some of them are larger, and would allow uh, uh, some things to be brought up through them. But you can also see there was a big open area in the center that was also used, covered over uh, when there was a an event, but uh, that was also there in order to allow a freer flow and, and allow uh, the attendants to bring uh, the animals up to the top. So again, a very well preserved pavement of the arena. And you can also see in this view that the seats, the cavia of the theater at Pozzuoli, also extremely well preserved. You can't tell here, uh, but the division into Cunei, the same. So we look to this amphitheater to give us a better sense of what the interior of the Colosseum would have looked like in ancient Roman times. We talked about the uh, Temple of Divine Claudius. I remind you of a model of it here again, and the relationship of that Temple of Divine Claudius with the temple, conventional temple, on top of a very tall podium. Uh, the fact that that looked back to the architectural experiments very early on, second to first centuries BC, at the sanctuaries of Jupiter Anxer at Terracina uh, and of Hercules Victor at Tivoli. Uh, it was th that kind of thing that was l being looked back to. And it's interesting to see uh, that it was that same plan, that idea of a great open rectangular space with a temple as part of it uh, that was used, and with the temple put along one of the longer ends, that was used by Vespasian uh, for his own forum in Rome, the so-called Forum Pacus. It's sometimes referred to as the Templum Pacus because we're not actually sure how it was used. We don't think it was actually used uh, as a, a typical <coughs> forum with shops and, and a law court and so on, but may have been used in a different way, and I'll speak to that in a moment. So we don't quite know what to call it, and we call it either the Forum Pacus or the Templum Pacus. In order to see its location, I show you this uh, view of all of the imperial fora in Rome, those fora that line the Via Imp De Fori Imperiali across from the Roman Forum. We've already looked at, here's the tail end of, or a si the side of the Roman Forum here, and right next to it, two fora that we've already discussed, the Forum of Julius Caesar and then the <coughs> Forum of Augustus. Nothing else, this wasn't there then, this wasn't there then. Uh, but Vespasian decides to build uh, a forum himself in close proximity to the Forum of Augustus. In fact, it's interesting to see that it faces. The temple is actually on this end, uh, so in a sense it faces the Forum of Augustus. So another sp smart uh, strategic move on the part, a smart political move on the part of Vespasian to associate himself not just with Claudius, the good emperor who was divinized, but also with Augustus, the founder of the Julio-Claudian dynasty and the first emperor of Rome. Uh, so to build his, his structure facing that of Augustus's, his temple <laughs> facing that of Augustus's. Uh, but you can see that he wants to outdo Augustus, so he makes his larger uh, than Augustus's. Uh, this area here that's labeled as the Forum of Nerva wasn't a forum at all at this point. It was a street uh, called the Argilatum, A-R-G-I-L-E-T-U-M. Uh, and that street, the Argilatum, and you can see it labeled up there, that street led into a part of Rome, a residential area of Rome that I've referred to before, called the Subora, S-U-B-U-R-A. The Subora was, again, a, a, a place where there were a lot of, 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 I've mentioned it again, we saw there a lot of, or there were there a lot of apartment houses, mostly made out of wood, rickety apartment houses that were lived in by large number of people with lesser means. Uh, and there were consequently always fires there, and you'll remember that Augustus' architects had to build that large precinct wall out of Peperino to protect the temple of Marzultor from the fires that used to break out all the time in the Sabora. So you have to imagine this as a, as a street in between the Forum of Augustus and uh, Vespasian's Forum Pacus in ancient Roman times. Uh, also interesting is again the plan, a rectangle with the temple on one end, uh, dominating the space in front of it. Uh, you can see that there are columns all the way around. There are uh, these, um, a, 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 these uh, alcoves that open off the center space, and you can see they're screened uh, from that center space also by columns. Uh, we know that uh, some exotic materials were used here, marble that was brought from other parts of the world. We saw that beginning already under Nero, bringing marble from Asia Minor and 
uh, and Af Africa and Egypt and so on for his buildings. That also continues under the Flavians, so another uh, Neronian innovation that remains important. Uh, we see it here. We see red granite columns used for the colonnade. We see yellow columns from uh, Africa used for the columns that screen uh, these alcoves from the larger space. And then we see mi white marble uh, for the rest. So this combination of imported marbles used for the Forum Pacus in Rome. The Forum Pacus no longer survives. You can't see any of it today. Uh, we do know its location, though, uh, and we do have a good sense of its plan, once again, from the so-called Forma Orbis, from this marble map of Rome uh, that has a, a few fragments of the, uh, of the Forum, uh, Forum Pacus. You can see one fragment here, one fragment here, and then a third fragment up there. Uh, and those fragments are enough, uh, when we look at those, study those, and compare those to other buildings to, to allow a very accurate reconstruction. Uh, it, it tells us the shape of the temple, and it shows us without any question, because one of the fragments includes lots of this, that this too, like the Claudianum in Rome, had uh, bushes, <laughs> had bushes in, in, uh, as uh, you know, a kind of garden uh, that decorated the center of the structure, so bringing uh, the country, in a sense, into the city uh, for these incredible complexes. This is a restored view, and you see it also on your monument list, of what the Forum Pacus would have looked like in antiquity. A quite severe facade, as it seems, uh, with a number of entrance ways. The temple pushed up, in fact, not only pushed up against the back wall, but part of the colonnade that flanks it on either side. You can see the red granite columns. Uh, you, can, you can't see uh, the yellow columns that, that would have been further in, uh, uh, screening the alcoves from the colonnade. You see a, an altar uh, right in front of the temple. You see the bushes uh, that were part of the plantings that made this look like a, a kind of garden uh, complex in front of the temple. We don't actually know if it was used as a temple. We have no uh, divinity that's been associated with it. Uh, we actually think it may have been used as a museum, as a museum, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. Here's another reconstruction. This one is from Ward Perkins. You can see that it is roughly the same uh, as it is the same as the other with one exception, and that is it, it shows an entranceway that's made up of three doors and a, a number of columns. This was thought for a very long time uh, to be the, f the, the, the case, that there was a, uh, an elaborate entranceway with columns and projecting entablatures, the sort of thing that we haven't seen yet in built architecture, but we did see in second style Roman wall painting. But that idea has been discredited, and now people believe it is much more likely that the facade was very plain. The reason that this idea came to the fore uh, is that eventually, when the Argillatum was filled in with a forum by Titus's second, by Vespasian's second son, Domitian, uh, Domitian did build a forum uh, that is in part preserved, and which we will look at next week, I believe. Uh, but uh, it, that forum had on the walls uh, a series of columns with projecting entablatures. So, and that does still exist now, or part of it does still exist. So I think that's what originally gave uh, archaeologists the idea that that was there before uh, and was part of Vespasian's complex, but that seems not to have been the case, and you, the reconstruction that you have uh, on your monument list is the one that you should go by. Let's get back to the whole point about the museum, whether this served as a kind of museum in the time of the Flavian emperors. I mentioned the great victory that Titus had over Jerusalem. Uh, a victory, at least from the Roman point of view, was great. Obviously, it was not great for Judea because the, uh, the area was taken over by the Romans and the famous uh, Jewish temple was destroyed. And uh, Titus also did not hesitate to uh, uh, ramble uh, through the, uh, with his men, with his soldiers, go through the temple and pick and choose what he wanted to bring back to Rome as spoils. He took the great seven-branched candelabrum from the temple. He took the Ark of the Covenant from the temple. He took a, a whole host of other items from the temple. And he brought them back to Rome as trophies. And we see this famous scene on the Arch of Titus, an arch that Domitian put up in honor of his brother, and we'll look at that on Tuesday. The Arch of Titus has a scene that depicts the Roman soldiers bringing the seven-branch candelabrum and a table with other objects on it from that temple back to Rome and parading with those through an arch. 
Uh, those spoils, we know, were placed by Vespasian, by his father, with whom he, he shared a joint triumph uh, because of this victory over Jerusalem. It was placed uh, in the Forum Pacus once that was built. So it was in part a, a place where he could <coughs> display the spoils of war uh, because of the fact that the legitimacy that he gained uh, through this conquest uh, was so important to his dynasty, to the right of his dynasty to rule and to the right of his sons to rule after him. Uh, so he wants to make that point clear, but again he's very shrewd politically and he also wants to make sure that the people have access to this. He, he wants to remind them when Nero was emperor of Rome, he had uh, things in his villa that he would never have dreamed of sharing with you. You weren't able to come in and dine there and have petals and fragrances fall on you while you dined. Uh, you, were, you were not allowed into this space. But now you can come to the Colosseum and you can go to this museum. And while you're in the museum, you may, might as well look at these great spoils that I captured uh, from Jerusalem that bring credit to me and legitimacy to my dynasty. He also took, what's also interesting and makes this more museum-like, uh, is that he also took some of the statuary that Nero had stolen from Greece when he went there to compete in those Olympic Games and so on, that he had stolen from Greece and elsewhere uh, and put it up in his villa. He also put those in the museum and opened that collection also to the Roman people. And we even know some of the statues uh, that were there, that were taken from Nero's Domus Aurea and put into this museum. One of them was a famous um, <coughs> cow, a cow that had been done by the well-known <laughs> Greek artist Myron, M-Y-R-O-N, the cow of Myron. Uh, and the second was a, a, uh, a, an image, a sculpted image. We're not sure, I don't think we know whether it was in marble or bronze, the original. Uh, but an image of a reclining uh, Nile River who is surrounded by 16 kids who are running around up and down on top of him and around him. Another famous statue that was in Nero's possession that gets put into what appears to have been a very important uh, museum. <coughs> you see here uh, another Google, an excellent Google Earth view, aerial view of part of the Roman Forum. The Colosseum, of course, is way over here. Uh, and we can see the central part, or part of the central part, of the Forum. We're looking back toward the Victor Emmanuel Monument. We're looking back toward the Campidoglio, as redesigned by Michelangelo, the Oval Piazza. And in fact, here we can even see in the upper left the Theater of Marcellus. So you can see that the Theater of Marcellus was basically in a diagonal, diagonal dialogue, in a sense, with the, uh, with the Colosseum that was located back over here. The reason that I show this view to you uh, now is to point out also the tabularium, which we've already looked at, the archives that's on the back of the sen senatorial palace redesigned by Michelangelo. Uh, but right in front of it, there was a temple that was put up in honor of Vespasian, by, at his death by his son Titus. And then when Titus died only a few years later, also of natural causes, uh, his brother Domitian became emperor and Domitian decided to rededicate the temple to both of them, to Titus, uh, to uh, Vespasian and also to Titus. So it became the temple of the two Dibi, Dewi, uh, because Titus was also divinized at his death. Uh, and there were statue bases that were found uh, that stood in front of this temple with inscriptions indicating that they honored those two individuals and that they uh, were um, depicted undoubtedly in statues in front of this temple. Only uh, three columns of that temple still survive, some of the foundations as well, of course, and you can see it in the Roman Forum uh, right near the tabularium in Rome. <laughs> Uh, if you look at it, you can see that these are Corinthian fluted capitals. Uh, it was probably a quite conventional temple. Uh, at, but you do see that there is a frieze that seems to represent a number of sacrificial implements, a, uh, a uh, libation dish and a pitcher and so on and so forth. A very large chunk of that frieze and entablature is still preserved today. It's not with the temple, but rather in the tabularium itself. Uh, and I show it to you here, an extremely well-preserved section of the uh, decorative frieze 
of the Temple of Vespasian, the Temple of Divine Vespasian in Rome, uh, which you see again dates to around 79 to 81 AD. And it's very instructive, not only in terms of the way in which uh, Titus first and then his brother were thinking of honoring members of their family, uh, but also in the, in the, uh, in the um, incredible, in, in how ornamental this is. I mean, that this is, this is decoration that is more richly textured uh, than any that we've seen thus far and also more richly undercut. The artists are beginning to use the drill uh, to create very deep shadows uh, among the decorative motifs to make them stand out even more. Uh, and you might remember, I didn't bring it back to show you, but you might remember that section that I showed you from the forum, from the Temple of Venus Genetrix in the Forum of Julius Caesar, where I mentioned that that had been restored uh, in the time of Domitian, second son of Vespasian, and also in the Trajanic period, and that the the very uh, deep carving indicated to us uh, that uh, the deep carving indicated to us not only that it had been done later, uh, but also the fact that the Flavians were particularly interested in this very ornamental decoration, very deeply uh, undercut ornamentation. And we see that so well here. We see also the interest in the variety of motifs uh, in this frieze. Uh, and in the decorative part of it. And then the frieze itself is very interesting. If we look at the objects, we see that they are mainly objects that are used in ritual sacrifice. Uh, we see the skulls of bulls, just as we saw them in the inner precinct of the Arapacus, one on either side. We see a libation dish. We see an axe over here. Uh, that's to knock out the animals. Here's the, uh, the um, knife to slit the throat of the animals. The pitcher to pour wine on an altar. Uh, a whip, for wh whatever purpose that had, uh, and then over here a helmet, as you can see. Uh, so all of these implements that were used in uh, sacrifice, regularly used in sacrifice, arranged uh, like a still life against a blank background. And I don't know about you, but when I look at this, I am reminded of some of fourth style uh, Roman wall decoration, of the still life paintings that we saw in the third and the fourth style, where you have individual objects uh, against a blank background, uh, and also uh, also the, uh, the decorative nature of this conjures up some of the decoration that we see, the profusion, the almost overly decorative uh, element of fourth style Roman wall painting. And since this dates to 79 to 81, and you'll remember the fourth style uh, is 62 to 79 at Pompeii, but we know that the fourth style continued on. It was the fourth style that was the most popular style post-79, obviously not in Pompeii but it, or Herculaneum, but elsewhere in the Roman world. So this very much in keeping, we're seeing in architecture something very much in keeping vis-a-vis -vis decoration uh, as we see in fourth style Roman wall painting. The last monument that I want to show you today is in many respects the most important. That seems like a strange thing to say, because what could be more important than the icon of Rome, the Colosseum? But when we think about it, the Colosseum was actually a fairly conservative building, right? I mean, it goes back to the, uh, the, the amphitheater at Pompeii and its general plan, and it is quite similar to, in fact, very similar to, the theater of Marcellus, which was done at the time of Augustus. And Augustus was trying to connect his reign uh, to that of Periclean and Athens and was using stone construction. Uh, and the Colosseum is of stone construction, although it also, of course, makes use of, 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 of annular vaults made out of concrete uh, and also innovates with the new groin vaults. But for, for, for all intents and purposes, a relatively conservative building at this time, the Colosseum was. The building that I'm now going to show you was not that way at all, uh, even though it's a building that is much less well known uh, than the Colosseum. And it also doesn't exist any longer, unfortunately. And, that, and those are the Baths of Titus, a very important structure for us. The Baths of Titus, the Termai Titi, the Baths of Titus, uh, that date to A.D. 80, right smack in the middle of Titus's brief reign of 79 to 81. Uh, they uh, were put up in Rome, and they were put up in Rome, not surprisingly, you know the, you know, you know the narrative here, uh, not surprisingly on that land that had earlier been expropriated by Nero. Another instance of the Flavian emperors giving back to the people. You've given them a museum, they, you've given them a, an amphitheater, 
Now you're going to give them a bath. Next to an amphitheater, the bath is what they wanted most of all, a place where they could go to bathe, but also hang out uh, with their family and friends. Uh, so again, giving back to the people uh, what they wanted. Wise, shrewd political move on the part of Vespasian, being followed by his equally shrewd son, Titus. The location of the Baths of Titus uh, was uh, next to, actually what you see here on top of the Golden House is actually the plan of a later bath, the Baths of the Emperor Trajan, which we'll look at in the future. But the smaller Baths of Titus were put uh, to the, um, I believe it was, yeah, the west of the uh, Esquiline Wing of the Golden House, right, uh, right just between the Golden House and where you see Esquiline written up there was the location of the Baths of Titus. All that survives of the Baths of Titus is what part of one wall, a brick-faced concrete wall with some engaged columns. That's all we have. But the building was still standing, uh, to, uh, the building was still much better preserved in the 16th century when it was drawn by uh, Renaissance architects, uh, most specifically by Andrea Palladio, whose name I put on the monument list for you. Andrea Palladio drew a very complete plan of it, and it is on the basis of that plan that modern uh, plans are made of the Baths of Titus, and I show it to you here. And we believe this is a very accurate plan of the Baths of Titus. And I compare it uh, to you, for you here with, again, those of you studying for the midterm, what's this? The Stabian Baths, Stabian Baths in Pompeii, second century BC, very good. Uh, and we talked about that as the typical, the typical earlier uh, bath structure and just a, a very quick review to remind ourselves of its major features. Uh, it had the uh, palestra over here surrounded by columns on three sides, the piscina or the natatio, swimming pool at the left, and then most importantly the bathing block on the right side of the structure a men's section and a women's section uh, with that sequence of rooms, the, uh, the, uh, the apoditerium or the dressing room, the tepidarium, rectangular, or the warm room, the caldarium, hot room with a, an apse and a cold water splash pool, a uh, cold water splash basin, and then most importantly the frigidarium, that r small round uh, building with radiating alcoves. That was the typical Roman bath structure until uh, we begin to see, uh, or th our first example in Rome of the so-called imperial bath structure, uh, the, t the plan that is used by the emperors for the baths that they build in Rome. It is possible that Titus's was not the first. There's been some speculation. We know that Nero had built a bath. There has been some speculation that Nero's bath may have been the first example of the imperial plan, but we don't know for sure. Uh, but Titus's, uh, of the ones that we know uh, have the specifics about, we know that Titus's was definitely an example of this imperial bath structure. And the features uh, that are outstanding here that we need to focus on are the fact that this imperial bath structure had a very elaborate entranceway uh, that consisted either of columns on square bases or piers in the front. Uh, there seemed to have been a series of groin vaults. Anytime you see an X, uh, in plan, that means a groin vault, uh, an elaborate stairway, some more columns or piers here, uh, and, and more groin vaults, and another stairway, leading into a double palestra, in a sense, or you could call it a combined palestra here, on the southern side. And then most, and, the, and the, you can see the cistern on the outside of the precinct, you can see the cistern that fed water into this bath structure. It's roughly rectangular, as you can see. And unlike the Stabian Baths at Pompeii, where you have the bath complex on the right side, you can see that the bath, <coughs> the rooms of bath, the, ba the rooms that are used for bathing are at the center of the plan, uh, which makes sense from, from the Roman standpoint. You know the Romans thought, you know, were very uh, focused on axiality and symmetry, and that's exactly what they've done here. They've placed the bathing block in the center, They've lined the rooms up I I axially with one another. They've placed rooms on either side, symmetrical rooms. It's the same on the left as it is on the right. Uh, the rooms are symmetrically disposed around that central bathing block. And they've taken the frigidarium, which was the smallest, albeit the most interesting architecturally, but the smallest room in the bath. And they've made it the largest room in the bath, because you can see at F, a very large cross-shaped room with an apse on one end, a groin vault over the center, a single large groin vault <laughs> over the center, 
flanked by and buttressed by two barrel vaults, one on either side, and then opening off those barrel vaults a series of rectangular uh, alcoves with, as you can see, with walls that are scalloped, uh, and then with columns that screen uh, those alcoves from the central groin vaulted space. So an entirely different way of thinking about the Frigidarium. Then that into the Tepidarium from the Frigidarium, again <laughs> through a screen of columns. That's, rec that's fairly conventional, rectangular. And then into, we see here, double caldaria, two caldaria. They also, in a kind of cross shape, uh, although a, a cross shape that appears a little bit more rounded uh, than the case of the Frigidarium, they too screened by columns on three sides, very open, very open, allowing a free flow of space uh, in a way that was not true of the Pompeian baths, where the entranceways were very tiny from one room to another. Here, a, a, a great deal of emphasis on the free flow of space. So what's, most, what's very important here, the way I want to end today, is, is essentially where I began. What innovations of Nero's architecture lived on, despite his Domnatio Memoriae, and despite the fact that his buildings were destroyed? His buildings no longer stood. The Domus Aurea no longer stood to be studied. Uh, and yet, uh, what we see is some of, uh, of the innovations did live on, and the ones that did uh, include, and let me just compare as the last image, compare uh, the octagonal room, an axonometric view of the octagonal room uh, with the baths of Titus in Rome. What we, what we see are some of the experimentations that were taking place in private architecture, palace architecture, and I, and I should make the point that just as we've said that tomb architecture was often very eccentric and very experimental, the same was true for private architecture. Not surprisingly, these are buildings that people make <coughs> personal decisions about. How do I want to live and what kind of spaces uh, do I want to live? Uh, and in what, and, and where do I, in what kind of building do I want to be buried? That's, those are very personal decisions and they were much more likely to be experimental decisions where public architecture had to toe the line to a certain extent and had to be more closely uh, allied with what had gone before and, and it was also more referential in terms of uh, looking back to other emperors and so on. So we see experiments in private uh, palace and tomb architecture, villa architecture, that we don't tend to see as much in public architecture. But what we see happening here is, act, is very momentous, and that is the lessons uh, that were explored first in private architecture are being adopted in the most public of all Roman buildings, a bath building. And, and it's being done in a very different way from the Colosseum. Most important, uh, the most important adoptions, innovations that uh, were in Nero's Domus Aurea that are also included in the Baths of Titus are axiality, symmetry, and I've described both of those already, new vaulted shapes, which we also did see in the Colosseum, the use of the groin vault extensively here, and then perhaps most importantly, this free flow of space. The free flow of space, the vistas, the panoramas from one part of this bath structure to another that is very different from the bath structure of the past, from the bath structure, structures, for example, of Pompeii. So what we see in sum is the fact that despite Nero's Domnatio Memoriae, despite the fact that that allowed uh, authorities, and in fact the, the new emperor, to destroy the portraits of Nero, to raise his palace to the ground, which Vespasian did after all. Despite that, the, uh, the architectural innovations of Nero's Domus Aurea lived on. They lived on in the Baths of Titus, and we're going to see they lived on in perpetuity, and we're going to see them continuing to have a huge impact on the evolution of Roman architecture. Thank you.